In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to make a relatively simple trestle table out of mostly common materials. The only materials that I use in this project that aren't common are two pieces of ash, but you can substitute that for a different type of wood that's easy for you to get. This particular design came from a previous customer that bought a farm table from me several years ago, but wanted a smaller table to go into their actual kitchen. We worked together and came up with a design um, to make this trestle table. It has a yellow pine top made out of two by tens ripped up and then all glued together into this nice thick top. It's one and three quarters inch thick and then it has a simple trestle base and it's all mortise and tenon together. And there's some fun little tricks and tips in this video um, as far as how it's made and you can just kind of follow along to see all that. Another cool aspect of this project is it's the first project that I've made plans for and you can see more on that in the description below. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first step of this project is already taken care of. I've prepped some of the materials. I've got all the strips that make up the top already cut. The next step I want to do is plane the faces. I prepped the materials to where they could be sitting in my basement for a while now, sort of drying out and getting acclimated to a climate controlled situation. Um, same thing goes for the 4x4s that are making up the legs. These are Douglas fir 4x4s. Um, this construction grade of lumber is not really truly dry when you buy it from Lowe's or Home Depot. It's been uh, kiln dried or heat treated, but that's mainly just to kill any insects and to get that moisture down enough to be used in a construction application. So it's been sitting, it's much more dry than when I first got it. So we're going to go ahead now and run those faces of those strips through the planer and get some sections glued up for the top. If you're looking for an inexpensive but good working planer, this is a Porter Cable. It's just one of those little portable ones and I've got it bolted down to a rolling base. I did a video about this planer. You can check the description for that link if you'd like to learn a little more about them. For doing the glue up, I'm just using a tight bond too. It's the premium, comes in the blue label. And then I'm going to be applying the glue to the uh, faces of those strips using a small roller and a paint tray. It's a really quick way to get the glue onto the surface without having to use a bottle. The glue up is the actual reason that I planed all these strips. By having them all planed, each face is smooth. It is just one solid plane on each side of those strips meaning that they all made up nicely. If I was just to rip these from the 2 by material directly from Lowe's and glue them up, there's a little bit away from all the milling marks. Uh, you don't always know if they're a consistent width all the way across or a consistent thickness across each strip. And all those little inaccuracies or um, inconsistencies will kind of multiply as you glue up the entire top and your top could be wavy. By having them all consistent, I'm going to get a really nice uh, flat um, slab from the get-go. And for gluing all these up, I'm just using just an assortment of clamps. You can see a mixture of Irwin clamps, bar clamps, and some Harbor Freight clamps, and so forth. As far as my wood choice, I get asked that uh, in other videos about why I use pine. Well, for one reason, that's what the customer wanted. Another reason, though, for this video is that it's a very accessible material that I'm able to um, uh, show in this video for customers that can just run to Lowe's and grab them. Well, now I'm starting to work on the actual foot of the trestle bases that are on either end of the table that support the top. I'm using some three and a half by three and a half inch Douglas fir. And these are just some strange untreated four by fours that the Lowe's near, uh, near me sells. If you don't have these, you can glue up, um, kind of laminate up some regular two by material and get the thickness you want and then plane, rip or plane it down to whatever thickness. Those pieces you saw me playing, which was four of them, are going to be the uprights. There's two on either end of the trestles. The next step is laying out the mortise uh, in the actual foot. That's a two by two inch mortise. And I'm cutting those out with a hollow chisel mortiser. If you don't have a hollow chisel mortiser, it's not a problem. You can do it on a drill press or you can do it with a hand drill and then square it out with a chisel. And if you really had to, you could do the whole thing with a chisel. That's how I first learned to do um, uh, mortises was by completely chiseling them out by hand. With the mortises cut in the lower parts of the legs, you're now going to cut the tenons on the two vertical parts of the legs. The tenon is going to be two inches by two inches and two inches long. The mortise itself is just past two inches deep. So that's going to give a little wiggle room in the bottom to where we don't end up uh, bottoming out on the actual tenon. And that'll make sure that the shoulder of the tenon sits um, nice and flush on the bottom portion of the 
leg, which I'm calling the foot in this case. I'm not sure if it has a technical name, but I'm going to refer to it as the foot. I'm going to be cutting these tenons on my radial arm saw, and you've seen me use it in the past. Now, of course, not everyone has one of these saws, but um, don't let that hold you back. There's many other ways, but the general way I'm going about it is it has a dado stack set up in there, and then I put on one of the legs a line that marks two inches. That's going to be the length of the tenon. And then I've set up this stop to where I can consistently flip the leg and slide it up against that. And then um, also do the same thing on the other leg. And I'm going to do, be doing this to four pieces of uh, three inch by three inch stop. So that gives me really consistent and quick ways to get tenons. But if you don't have a radial arm saw, there are the ways. I'll talk about that really quick. You can use the table saw, and um, you can use a crosscut sled. There's a simple one I made a while back, and that will establish the baseline, uh, the shoulder line of your tenons, and then you can just then nibble off the rest with your um, single uh, thickness table saw blade. You can also use just a regular old miter gauge. Most saws are going to come with one, and then you can see I have this set up for a finger joint jig, but I can also use that 2x4 just as extra support for one doing tenons and if you go this route you can put a dado blade on your table saw and cut that material off even quicker and cleaner. Um, the other way to mention, of course there are more ways that I'm going to mention now, but is using good old fashioned hand tools. So here's a selection of tools that you can easily um, get some tenons with. It's not going to be as quick as these other options but it's a fine option. These are just a couple different saws. Uh, this is a $10 saw from Harbor Freight. This is a saw I got for a couple dollars. This one I got for free. This was a very inexpensive little plane. 50 cent chisels from um, flea markets and I won't mention the price on this one. This one was quite a bit more um, bought new from Lee Nielsen. But just to show you that hand tools are another option. You're going to see me use a lot of different tools in my videos that you might not have but don't let that stop you. You can get just as good a result using a variety of tools. These particular little hand planes here, the reason I pulled those out is they are shoulder planes. And what that means is the blade goes right up to the edge, um, to the outside of the plane. You can see it has an open mouth on the um, edge there. And that allows you to plane right up to the shoulder of the actual tenon. But if you don't have one of those types, you can use just a, just a small block plane like this Stanley and then clean up that cheek of those uh, tenons right up to the shoulder with a chisel. So I just want to give you a couple other options to get those tenons cut. For cutting the tenons, I wanted to show you the steps that I normally go through. First is marking the length of the tenon. With the rule on my slide adjusted to the length of the tenon, I can just go around it and mark, and then come back with another square and actually draw that line. From here I like to take a box cutter or some sort of chisel or razor blade and go ahead and score that line. That makes sure that when I'm cutting that tenon, regardless of the tool that I'm using, that uh, some sort of a splinter doesn't go past that baseline and makes for an extra clean joint. So that's one uh, little tip in the video that can be applied regardless of the project that you're working on. And for cutting these tenons, again I'm using a radial arm saw. You can use other tools, but this is what I'm using and then the length of that tenon again is um, being established by that stop. You can see it's that 2x4 and that piece of uh, the wood that I'm actually cutting the tenon on, I just keep making cuts until it hits that and that's a really consistent way to cut your tenons um, from each element in your piece of furniture to the next. When I'm cutting tenons I like to oversize them just a little bit. You can see that that fits a little too tight and then I bring them down to their final size with a rabbit plane. There's the fit nice and uh, clean joint and fits in there nice and snug for a good glue joint. The last thing on these legs is to cut them to length and being sure to include the length of the tenon. I've done it many times where I forget the actual tenon and chop it too short and that would be a shame after already doing the work on the tenons on the other end. What you're seeing me work on now is the actual support that will um, support the underside of the table. So the basic of the trestle is sort of like a capital I but there's two vertical um, vertical pieces and this is the top horizontal part of that eye. And both of these pieces will get mortises that correspond with the bottom of the trestles. It's not necessary but the top part of the leg structure in my table is made of ash. I just want something a little more stiff than pine or some other type of a softwood and uh, ash is just what I had. 
So the legs are going to come up and there'll be th um, two tenons in either end. There'll be one here and one here. And these are through tenons, meaning that the tenon goes all the way through the piece that it's mortised into. And this being a piece of ash is gonna be uh, particularly dense and a little tricky for my hollow chisel mortiser with that three quarter inch bit to be able to cut through very easily. So what I've done is went ahead and um, removed the bulk of the material on my drill press using a Forstner bit. Then I'll go to the mortiser and kind of square out those corners. And if it still gives me trouble, I can do the rest by hand. And again, you don't need the hollow chisel mortiser to do this step. You could square these out with a chisel. Um, it's not too bad. In ash, it's a little hard, but you can get it done. Next up is getting those tenons cut. And I wanted to show you the steps for getting that set up. First, I line the blade with the mark, then I set that stop. You can see how it makes contact, and you can see the shape of that stop. I have a, um, a miter cut on the end of it, and that accommodates any dust that gets in there and doesn't throw it off. So any kind of dust will get shoved back in there, and the point of that stop is what actually makes contact with the piece that you're cutting. These tenons are the same. I bring them down to their final dimension with the rabbit plane and then give them a test fit. Next up, I need to prepare some rail material. The rails connect the two vertical parts in each trestle. And then that rail, there's two of them on each trestle. I mean, one of them on each trestle, two total in the stretcher that goes from one trestle to the other uh, connects to those rails. I hope that wasn't too confusing. You'll see a little bit more soon. There's one of those uh, rails kind of clamped in place temporarily, just kind of figuring out its length and vertical position. Cutting the mortises on the legs of each trestle is also done on the hollow chisel mortiser. You can substitute whatever tools you have. Um, and uh, if you end up getting the plans, all the dimensions and the layout for all that's in there. I cut all the tenons also on the um, radial arm saw. And then I cut the width, established the width of the, each tenon with my just a handsaw. You can cut those on a bandsaw if you have one or whatever kind of tool best suits your um, project. Now with all that layout, uh, I mean with all the machining done, I can go ahead and cut out the shape of the foot part of my trestles. And it's good to kind of hold off on cutting this kind of shape out as long as you can because uh, other machining processes it's nice to have it be nice and square. There it is. My grizzly bandsaw is uh, a wonderful tool to have in this situation. It's a 17 inch bandsaw and I've done some videos on that if you want to learn more about it. Um, but a smaller bandsaw will also work. You could also use something like a jigsaw and then kind of clean it up the best you can with some additional tools. The taper cut you saw me make was on the underside of the table supports and then I clean that up with my hand plane and then go to my oscillating spindle sander to clean up the bandsaw marks on the foot parts of the trestle. I just got the two radiuses on either end of the cutout on the bottom of the foot smoothed out on my spindle sander, but when it comes to straightening out this long line here, you got two ways to go about it. You can flatten out the whole underside of the surface, or you can straighten out just the part you can see, which is just this edge here. In this situation, it doesn't matter if this is perfectly flat, so all you need to do is take a small hand plane or any hand plane that you have and kind of tilt it on about a 45 degree angle or so skewing it down towards the bottom of the cut and then just make a light pass on that corner and what this is going to do is it's going to take out any of that wave that you got in using a bandsaw or a jigsaw and that is one really quick way and all you're doing in that case is your uh, angle of sight is going to come down at this angle so you can't see that bottom uh, bottom face on the leg all you can see is that very edge so just by straightening that edge, it gives the appearance of that whole underside of that cut being perfectly straight. And um, you could, of course, smooth out that whole bottom, but in this case, it's that far off the floor. No one's crawling under there. So that's a really quick way to get a nice straight edge on a bandsaw or jigsaw cut. Next up, I need to cut a little shallow mortise in the rail that's between the two vertical parts of the trestle. And this mortise is what will take the tenons on the ends of the stretcher that connect the two trestles. I'm cutting out this mortise on my drill press using a three quarter inch Forstner bit. And then I'll go to my workbench and clean out uh, all the corners and the sides, get everything squared up with a chisel and mallet.
Another step you're going to see me do repeatedly in this video is knocking back the corners of all my pieces. I make sure I do this and that makes your corners stronger and I do so just with a little small plane. The next step that I do is making the recesses for the attachment from the table supports up into the top itself. I do this with a large Forstner bit and then a 5 16 inch drill bit for the shank of the screw to go through that attaches to the tabletop. That gives it a little room to slip back and forth for expansion and contraction. Now I've turned the attention to making the stretcher. We're cutting the tenons on the end of the stretcher that connects the two ends of the mortise. The tenons themselves were cut on the radial arm saw like all the others, and then the excess cut off at my bench with a handsaw. After a quick test to see if it fits, everything looks good. Well, as far as the base goes, that's all the parts completed. Still need to go back in and knock off all the hard edges on all the components. Uh, I'll do so using a hand plane on the straight edges, spindle sander on the curves. I like using those tools to do it versus a router because it gives a little more of a handcrafted look where everything's not dead even. Uh, the other thing I'm going to be doing is wedging these through tenons where the upright parts, the vertical parts of the legs, go through the horizontal top support. So there'll be two slits on the top of each tenon. I'm going to do that on the bandsaw, and that's optional. You don't have to, but basically that's just going to lock that joint in even more. Another option is um, if you want to do something beyond just the glue joint, is you could drill through here and have it be a peg joint. Same goes for any of these mortise and tenon joints. It just depends what kind of a look you're going for. The only other thing to do on the base uh, outside of painting it will be um, deciding on exactly what kind of hardware I'm going to use right here. You could glue this joint, but you're not really dealing with a lot of a glue surface as far as long grain goes. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is drilling through here and then using some sort of a lag bolt, plus I'll glue the joint. And partly that is just to get some hardware into the piece that was sort of part of the order was um, just some sort of a hardware, visible hardware. So I'm going with some sort of blackened bolts right there. So that's pretty much it. Let's take care of those last details of getting the base put together. When it comes time to cut wedges, if you so choose, you don't have to worry about these being straight, square, or anything accurate, really. It just needs to be a slot going from the end of the tenon down to the base, because all it needs to do is have a piece of wood wedged down in there and expand a little bit. Now, I've already done it multiple times in the process of building this piece of furniture, but I always recommend fully assembling the piece without glue before going ahead and applying glue to all your joints. It's called a dry run, and this allows you to figure out how you need to clamp it together, the order you needed to put together, um, and so forth. This just gives you a little extra security to make sure that you don't end up with any problems um, during the actual process of gluing it together. You can end up with quite a disaster on your hands. I cut the wedges off camera just out of some scrap ash left over from that top support and uh, you just saw how they're actually going to end up going in. So the first thing I do is just get a little glue down in there and just rake it off into those um, little slits and you don't need much in there it's mainly just trying to hold them in place then you want to take a plane and kind of size the wedge to the proper width I cut them a little oversized rub a little glue on them and then just hammer them in until they don't go in anymore and in certain situations you do have to be careful wedges are very powerful so make sure that you don't break your piece that you're actually putting them into for smoothing them up I just knock them down with a hand plane and then you can sand them down a little uh, smoother if you'd like with a belt sander. The dimensions of this particular table are 5 feet long and 3 feet wide. So as you remember from the beginning of this video, it started out by gluing up three uh, slabs that were slightly wider than 12 inches. What I did is I made them pretty much as big as they could be to fit in my 12 and a half inch planer to where I could then do what I'm doing here in this clip which is joining the edges with my track saw. You can uh, use kind of whatever tool you have that's best suited for this such as a joiner or setting up a DIY track saw with your circular saw. With straight edges on all my slabs I laid them up onto my table saw, marked out the positions for biscuits and cut them with the biscuit joiner.
For gluing this top up, I'm using my homemade clamping rack. It's just something I came up with for to be a space saver in my shop and it just overall makes things easier. I made it mainly for my farm tables, but I designed it to where it can accommodate thicker tops by having it to where I can add spacers behind the slab that I'm gluing up. With all the spacers removed, I'm able to glue up tops two to three inches uh, thick. So I first adjusted the support on the bottom, that thing you saw me using my impact wrench for, that adjusted the support to accommodate a three uh, three foot wide top. I can um, glue something up to eight feet wide on the rack itself longer if I put clamps on the parts that are hanging out. Then I just apply glue and biscuits to those slabs, stack it up, and then I put those F clamps on you see there. That keeps everything from safe from not flipping out on me as I'm applying pressure. I put a strip of wood across the top to protect it against the pads on the clamps and then just kind of uh, go back and forth tightening things down until it's got even pressure. It works great, saves a lot of space, makes things much easier on me. With the top clamped up and the glue drying, I turn my attention towards finishing the base. First thing I need to do is drill the holes for the lag bolts that are going to hold the stretcher together. And the stretcher is the piece that goes between the two ends of the tables, the um, trestles you see me drilling through there. And the customer I'm building this for, they wanted some sort of exposed hardware. So we ended up going with the lag bolts on the ends to where they'd be nice and visible. So I drilled the holes through the trestle and the corresponding holes into um, the tenons themselves. Next was getting everything painted up. I'm just using an Olympic Icon paint. This is a uh, paint primer combo. The color was Chives. If you're interested, there's the paint chip. And you can get that uh, brand of paint at Lowe's. This is a flat paint, and I just painted it all with a brush. I'm using one of these little short stubby brushes that you can get at Lowe's. They're really handy for painting furniture like this. Otherwise, you can um, cut the handle down short on brushes, which gives you a little more clearance for working in tight spots. The last thing I did before applying, uh, before assembling and clear coating the base was knocking back all the corners with a good sharp hand plane. This kind of highlights things and adds just a little extra interest. For curved spots, I use a card scraper. For preparing the hardware, I'm just starting out with regular old lag bolts. I think these were 3 8 inch lag bolts. I'm knocking off that zinc plating on my belt sander and that's just going to make it a little easier to darken them in just a minute and it takes off any of that stamping. For taking the finish off of the washers, I just hot glued them to a 2x4 and worked it down. Of course that's going to heat them up and want to pull them off so you kind of have to dip everything in water to keep it cool. Next is adding a black finish. I'm doing this just by heating them up. You could also use some sort of bluing, uh, bluing, fluid, bluing fluid or either paint them. But heat is a good way to do it. I just use a little acetylene torch and you saw the difference that it makes there in the end. And in this case, I'm going to be spraying a clear coat over the whole thing, which will further rust, uh, give it a little rust proofing. But you could do something like rub some wax on it or something too. Um, for putting the base together, I just applied a little glue to that short tenon popped it in place and then ran those lag bolts in with my impact driver. Last thing I did is sprayed a clear coat. You can pretty much use anything you have. I used uh, some lacquer here. Uh, this is a deft spray lacquer satin and it has a really nice look but one thing I've noticed is when you spray it over water-based paints like this it's a little bit tacky for a while so not sure how good that is. You could use some sort of spray enamel or a uh, water base, something like a Minwax Polycrylic, or just rub some wax over if you want. At this point, the glue is all set on the top, so I can go ahead and start getting it ready for finish. Start out by scraping the glue off the glue joints on the bottom of the table and then sanding those seams down flush. And so this is the bottom of the table, so don't go overboard, but I do get it pretty nice. Um, and then before I do any finish, I always run my vacuum over top of the table. This helps keep any dust and uh, makes it easier on the second and third coats of finish. Well, once I got the finish on the bottom, I flipped it over and started in on the top, getting everything down sanded. I give it first an initial sanding, and then I come back and I fill any little small imperfections. This customer wanted a pretty smooth top, so I went ahead and filled in pretty much every little um, imperfection in the wood, such as knots. I used my track saw to cut a nice clean square edge. I always glue things up longer than the actual dimension. This is a much easier way to go about it and your end result is a very clean end without any shifting, um, just really smooth, especially using a track saw. I eased the edges back with a roundover bit. I think this was a quarter inch roundover 
and then I'm going back over all of those little uh, filled in spots with my orbital sander and then I followed it up with its final sanding with a half sheet sander. Before finishing, I always blast myself off, uh, get all the dust off of me and the table itself. This makes sure that dust doesn't fall off you, especially if you're wearing hats or a, a, a shirt and stuff stuck on your sleeves. You're leaning over the table, things are falling down in your finish. Um, also, it's good to let your um, shop, let the air kind of settle a little bit, run an air filter in it if possible. You can take a 20-inch box fan with a 20-inch household filter. It'll clean the air up pretty good before you do finishing. For um, applying finish, I'm just brushing it on using a satin Minwax polyurethane. This table ended up getting about four coats of polyurethane. Um, did the last coat outside because I was doing some dusty work in the basement. For assembling the top, uh, this whole thing was so heavy I wouldn't be able to really move it very easily on my own. So what I did is I sat the base in my truck and I did the final assembly in the back of my truck just getting it all centered. Now you'll get to see the hardware that I'm using. I'm using a long two and a half inch Craig screw. It was just one of the outdoor ones, doesn't have to be an outdoor one. And then a fender washer. And what that does is that allows enough shifting back and forth for expansion throughout the seasons. Then the table's ready for delivery. Here were some uh, little glamour shots of the table inside my house before I actually took it outside, but I wanted to show you sort of the end result, um, all the features. I'm really happy with the way the table turned out. This project turned out to be a very enjoyable one for me and it was pretty involved all the way from designing it with the customer, building it in my shop, filming the video and making the plans and of course editing the video. There was a lot to it and uh, but I kind of like that you know a lot of times in the shop a lot of projects just kind of blur together even if they are different things it's always just cutting and gluing wood together so I like adding a little twist to things um, so that is an added benefit of me having the YouTube channel. And I hope you all got something out of this video, whether it just be one of the techniques that I used to complete the project or the design itself. Uh, when it comes to the plans, you can get uh, more details below in the description. There'll be a link for you to click on where you can learn more about it. Um, and as far as using those plans, if you're someone in business, feel free to use this to make money. I don't mind that at all. Uh, that's a good thing. So, yeah. Uh, if you have any questions at all, just feel free to ask them in the comments below here on YouTube through messaging, Facebook, or send me an email. And you can get all that information right on the home page and the about page of my YouTube channel. So thank you all so much for joining me. I'm looking forward to seeing you in future videos. And I've got plenty of other videos similar to this. If you like it, for example, making this kitchen island right here, I'll put that link in the description as well for you to click on if you'd like to see more furniture making. So thanks for watching. Well, as always, if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, click the red button on the screen now and you can become a subscriber of my YouTube channel and keep up with all my future videos. And if you'd like to see more on the plans that I talked about in this video, you can click the link in the description below and that will take you to a page on my brand new website and tell you all about them. So check them out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.